You can support In the Past Lane with as little as $1 a month. Just go to the support page at our website, inthepastlane.com. Thanks. In March 1865, as the Confederacy reeled from a string of defeats on the battlefield and shortages of food on the home front, the Confederate Congress did what even a few years earlier would have been unthinkable. It authorized the drafting of 300,000 slaves as soldiers to serve in the Confederate Army. The measure was born of extreme desperation, and even still, it was intensely controversial. Confederate Major General Howell Cobb of Georgia summed up the problem when he said, If slaves make good soldiers, our whole theory of slavery is wrong. You are listening to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more... To huddled union, masses yearning to breathe consider free. Consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. That all men and women are created equal. Give me liberty or give me death. Nobody is free until everybody's free. The government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. History matters because it's not just about the past. History's about us, here and now. It explains the world we live in and why things are the way they are. And history gives us insights into how to achieve a more just, peaceful, and prosperous future. So people, let's do this. Hi there, everyone. Welcome to In the Past Lane, the podcast about American history and why it matters. I'm host Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, and this is In the Past Lane, episode 169, in which we examine a major myth about the Civil War, namely that tens of thousands of free and enslaved African Americans fought on behalf of the Confederacy. We are brought to you by SBI, Snoring Beagle International, and come to you this week from the Silas Chandler Studios, located in central Massachusetts. You can learn more about me, this podcast, and our guests at our website, inthepastlane.com and on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and our YouTube channel. The commander of this Motley Podcast Regiment is executive producer Lulu Spencer. So what's happening in In the Past Lane this week? Well, I successfully completed my 100-mile bike ride to raise funds for research into Parkinson's disease. Thanks to everyone who donated, I managed to raise over $2,500, so I'm pretty pumped about that. And if you still want to donate, it's still possible. Just go to the show page for this episode and you'll see a link. Thanks. And speaking of support, I hope you'll check out the merchandise available at inthepastlane.com. Lots of great history-themed t-shirts, mugs, stickers, hoodies, and all that. So check it out. And remember, anything you buy gives us a little income that helps us pay for the cost of producing this podcast. So thanks. All right, let's get to the main event. My interview with historian Kevin Levin about his new book, Searching for Black Confederates, The Civil War's Most Persistent Myth. Okay, people, better bring along a hammer. We're going myth-busting on this one. My first encounter with the Black Confederate myth came when I was conducting photo research for a U.S. history textbook that I've co-authored. My search for images of African-American soldiers in the Union Army turned up a strange image of what claimed to be Black Confederate soldiers who comprised something called the First Louisiana Native Guard. But a little more research revealed that the original photo was of black Union soldiers, wearing standard-issue gray overcoats and flanked by a white officer in Union blue. The Union Army insignias are clearly visible on the men's caps. It's also well established that this photo was taken in Philadelphia in 1864, and that it was used on recruiting posters to encourage more black men to enlist in the Union Army. So how did a group of black men who volunteered to fight in a war to destroy slavery somehow morph into a regiment of black confederates who fought to save the South, and with it, slavery? The answer is twofold. First, there's Photoshop, which made it possible to erase any sign that these men were Union soldiers. And second, there's the desire among some Americans to invent evidence of black confederates, to bolster a myth that African Americans fought in support of the Confederacy. To help us understand where this myth of black confederates originated, I'll speak with historian Kevin Levin. He's a scholar of the American Civil War, who edits the blog Civil War Memory. He's also the author of Remembering the Battle of the Crater, War as Murder, and editor of Interpreting the Civil War at Museum and Historic Sites. In the course of our conversation, Kevin Levin explains how the Black Confederate myth emerged in the 1970s in response to the Civil Rights Movement and new historical scholarship that emphasized the centrality of slavery in the Civil War, 
how the Confederate military effort relied on the labor of tens of thousands of African Americans, but as enslaved workers, not as soldiers. Why many white Confederates brought enslaved men to accompany them as servants during their service in the war. How and why historic photographs and official government records are either misinterpreted or willfully misrepresented as evidence of black Confederate soldiers. How the black Confederate myth has found its way into textbooks and public history exhibits. And what the current popularity of the black Confederate myth reveals about our insufficient efforts to come to terms with slavery and the Civil War. Kevin Levin, welcome to In the Past Lane. Great to be here. If one were to Google the phrase Black Confederates, it would bring up hundreds of websites and thousands upon thousands of references. So this might make some people wonder about the title of your book, Searching for Black Confederates, because to them it might seem that searching for and finding evidence of Black Confederates is really easy. But your book makes clear that Black Confederates never existed and that the origin of the myth of Black Confederates dates back to recent times, the late 1970s. So tell us about where this myth comes from and how you got interested in it. Well, you know, it's certainly true that if you, you know, were to Google, um, you know, search online for Black Confederates, uh, you know, you will come across uh, literally hundreds of websites. And I think for people, you know, who are, you know, unfamiliar with the, the, the relevant history, the historical context, uh, and are simply, you know, unable to properly search and assess online information, I think the fact that there are so many websites, um, you know, will serve as confirmation that, in fact, these black Confederate soldiers existed. Uh, There are accounts, firsthand accounts that you can read. Uh, There are photographs that you can um, look at online. So I think for a lot of people, uh, that's where it begins and ends. But the story, you know, is what I found is much more complicated, uh, much more interesting. In fact, Mm -hmm. the actual reference to black Confederates, African-Americans, free and enslaved serving as soldiers in the Confederate Army really doesn't surface until the 1970s, really the mid-1970s. Yeah, 100 years later. Yeah, absolutely. And so first, these stories begin to appear in a small number of vanity press books. And then once the internet rolls around, you know, a little bit later on, you know, that's where this story, this narrative really begins to pick up steam. You know, that's obviously a problem because, you know, anyone today can start a website a blog, a social media page, and you can add whatever content you want. And again, if you're unable to properly search and assess this information, you can fall into this trap. Yeah, it does seem that this is a great example of the crying need for digital literacy. My wife is a high school librarian, and so is very much aware of this debate going on about, in a sense, a new task for today's librarians, which is to be part of that new effort to teach digital literacy so people can distinguish between sources. Just because something looks legitimate doesn't mean that it is. That's right. So historians are always about context, you know? So what's the context of the 70s that makes this new dimension of, of Civil War memory appear? Yeah, it's really interesting because it's this period you know, we're coming out of the civil rights movement. We're coming out of a period of time where African Americans, Americans in large numbers, are are sort of pushing back and or pushing for civil rights, racial equality, and you know, within that movement, there's a lot of uh, focus on aspects of the Civil War and Reconstruction that were traditionally ignored. And right at the center of that mm-hmm. is the story of emancipation, the story of African Americans fighting in large numbers for the United States Army. And it's in response to this, you know, or I should say continuing into the 1970s, you know, we see public history sites or historic sites beginning to broaden their narrative. But it's really the airing uh, and the success of the television miniseries Roots, Mm -hmm. where I first began to pick up these glimmers of black Confederates. And, you know, I found in a number of magazines references by some of the leadership in organizations like the Sons of Confederate Veterans, where they are, you know, sort of worried about the success of this narrative, or I should say the television series Roots, you know, sort of focusing on more of the dark history of slavery, again, the service of black soldiers, and they're worried that their preferred narrative of the war, a narrative that is rooted in the bravery of the soldiers, the righteousness of the Confederate cause, is now, you know, being attacked. And so I think they find the black Confederate narrative to be a way to counter that or to balance out the equation, right? You had your black soldiers in the United States Army, and we also have our own black Confederate soldiers. And we were both, you know, fighting for equality. In other words, it's a way of painting, as as bizarre as this sounds, it's a way of sort of painting the Confederacy 
as this progressive experiment in race relations. Mm. And that's sort of the environment in which these references first appear. It's striking because you really won't find any references at all to soldiers before the 1970s, going all the way back to the war itself. And part of this also is to, as you say, one of the long-term goals is, you know, if you can create this myth of Black Confederates and this idea of, you know, some sort of equality or progressive character to the Confederacy, then you can go on, continue to wave the flag. That's right. And to build monuments and to celebrate Robert E. Lee's birthday and all the things that are part of that. And it kind of insulates the lost cause and That's insulates right. the Confederate heritage movement from any kind of accusations of being tied to slavery and racism. That's exactly right. And it's a continuation of sort of the challenge that ex-Confederates faced in the aftermath of the war. White Southerners uh, rallied around what you might call the lost cause narrative, which was this sort of narrative of the war that helped white Southerners sort of defend the cause for which they were fighting for, even in defeat. And so they highlighted generals like Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson as Mm -hmm. Christian warriors. They continued to defend the cause for which they were fighting. And at the center of that lost cause narrative was the belief that they were not fighting to protect slavery, even though in 1861, Confederate leaders like Vice President Alexander Stevens and others were very upfront very vocal about the importance of defending white supremacy and slavery right through the end of the war. But in defeat, now, of course, you know, given that slavery is no longer a reality, they have to somehow sort of renegotiate, reinterpret, revise what they were fighting for. And so, of course, states' rights becomes the center. But that loyal slave narrative, and I think that is, you know, the black Confederate narrative, I think, is just a modern version of that loyal slave narrative. It's just tweaked in a way that that deals with the reality of the 1970s as opposed to the 1870s. Right. And and that's a key part of the lost cause myth, which is, as you point out, that allegedly the war was not about slavery, but also that slavery itself was totally cool, totally fine. In that era, everybody was in their place. Slaves were not. That's right. Only radical abolitionists who make up these false stories about violence and oppression and misery. That's right. Actually, what's really true, according to the myth, is that slaves were very happy and very loyal. And that's sort of the first chapter. And then what happens by the 1970s is an effort to turn loyal slaves into loyal soldiers. Yeah. So maybe we should circle back to the evidence. Your book really makes it clear that African-Americans, both free and enslaved, played a huge role in the Confederate military effort. I mean, they're very clearly there in the army camps. Yeah. Um, And this is borne out in photographs and letters and diaries of Confederate soldiers and in Confederate military records. But at first glance, it looks like there's a lot of potential black Confederates, but who are these people and what is their actual role? What is their actual status that your research reveals? Yeah. I mean, these first two chapters in the book, I was really hoping that they sort of helped to advance this discussion because, you know, so often, you know, the debate is about whether or not these black Confederate soldiers existed, right? And Mm. that's where it begins and ends. And to me, that's not really the interesting question. The more interesting question, and I guess I'm sort of you know, this is coming from the perspective of a historian, is what was the role of African-Americans, of enslaved people within the Confederate war effort? And there really hasn't been that much done on that. I hope at least these first two chapters begin to sort of shed some light on it and, and maybe help some people, you know, direct them to additional or further research. But let's keep in mind that the, the population of the Confederacy of the slaveholding South in 1861 is roughly 9 million. About half that population is enslaved. We know, of course, you know, the difference in terms of war material, population of the North. And so we know, of course, that the Confederacy has to mobilize as much of its population as possible. It has any chance of engaging in a protracted war with the United States. And so, of course, they have to mobilize their enslaved population. And they do throughout the war, they do quite often as impressed slaves. They impress enslaved people into the Confederate war effort more generally. And And often against the will of the enslaved owners, right? Quite often. There's been a little bit of research on North Carolina and Virginia in recent years, and it suggests that slaveholders may have been a bit more willing to part with their enslaved people. But I think overall, that point certainly resonates. But they would have been um, helping to construct earthworks, building rail lines. They would have been working in hospitals. They would have uh, been working in salt mines. Places like Tredegar Ironworks in Richmond, helping to produce artillery, shells, etc. Anything that the Confederacy needs uh, enslaved people to work on to support the war effort, 
they would have been involved in. The other place, of course, in which you would have found enslaved people, and this is really, I think, the, the sort of focus of these first two chapters, is in the army itself. Mm-hmm. Many of them would have been impressed uh, working as Teamsters, again, stevedores. Robert E. Lee's army, it's estimated in the summer of 1863 during the Gettysburg campaign, may have included as many as, as nine, ten thousand 10,000 enslaved people marching north. And it really gives you a sense of how central slavery is to not just the Confederacy, but the Confederate war effort itself, the Confederate mm-hmm. armies that are operating in the field. And then, of course, the other way in which they are functioning is as body servants or what I call camp slaves. And so if you are an officer, usually officers in the slaveholding class, you would have brought a slave from home with you that would have functioned as, again, what I call a camp slave. And, you know, those servants, uh, those enslaved people would have been performing any number of roles to support the officer in question, right? Cooking, cleaning, helping with uh, carrying materials on long marches. Mm -hmm. So they are there in every place, if you will, every aspect of the Confederate war effort, you would have found enslaved people. And so, again, I think that is something we've completely missed in our understanding of, of the Confederate armies specifically, just how central enslaved people were to allowing white men to be able to carry a rifle and fight on the battlefield. And one of the things that obscures the reality of this are some of the photographs yeah. associated with this Confederate military effort, and the one on the cover of your book, and the one is probably the most popular one on these black Confederate websites, is the one of Silas Chandler yeah. and Sergeant Andrew Chandler from 1861. Tell us about what's in that photograph and why it is so easily either misinterpreted or willfully misrepresented. Yeah, it's a fascinating photograph. And it is one of the, as you said, it is one of the more popular photographs that you can find online. And quite often it is misinterpreted. It's, you know, it is interpreted by many as the clearest evidence that black men fought as soldiers. And, and I think for those who are just not educated, not familiar with the relevant historical context, it's easy to see why, right? I mean, both men are wearing uniforms. Uh, both men appear to be heavily armed. Right. The photograph is likely taken in 1861, just after Andrew Chandler enlisted in the 44th Mississippi. And he brought with him Silas, who had been with the family almost since birth, had moved with the family from Virginia to Mississippi. And again, that scene was very typical of a slaveholder bringing an enslaved man with him. They took it obviously at a studio. It is not at all clear, or I should say, actually, um, one expert has suggested that the weapons that you see are, in fact, studio props. Mm -hmm. The uniform that Silas is wearing may also have been a studio prop, although it's not clear because, you know, as I point out in the book, camp slaves were quite often wearing uniforms. Mm -hmm. And that makes it, I think, much more confusing to people. But there were a number of reasons why these men were wearing uniforms. Some of them were outfitted by their uh, masters perhaps as a reflection of their own social status. Mm -hmm. Some of them I found, which is even more interesting, some of them actually, these camp slaves purchased uniforms for themselves. So when they're in camp, they would have had a a good deal of free time. And during that free time, many of them were allowed to work for others for money, for pay. And there are a number of examples I've come across where they decide to buy a uniform or part of a uniform. And why they do this is very, very difficult to discern because, of course, we don't have the kind of evidence that you would need to get at motivation. But I suspect some of them wanted to feel as if they were part of the army. They, it may have made them feel as something other than mm-hmm. someone who's been owned for their entire life. Right. So for any number of reasons, but it certainly did not change the legal status of these men. Right. And one can imagine it might also make it easier to move about the camp when you've got many African-Americans of many different status levels, perhaps wearing a gray uniform. It would sort of be a signal to guards and to patrols to say, oh, I'm with my master. It it makes things easier. It's very interesting. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. The other thing that I found interesting is that, again, when you think of the large numbers of these camp slaves that were present during the war, it turns out that they organized themselves into rank. So during Mm -hmm. long marches, it was quite common for camp slaves to march together. And I found a number of cases where they begin to organize themselves into a kind of a system of rank uh, Mm -hmm. based on any number of factors. And so those uniforms, I I assume, would have played a role in in those marches and, and sort of in that hierarchy, if you will. Right, a way to kind of 
purchase on some level a little more authority, a little more power within these yeah. smaller, very powerless circles. Exactly. Well, one of the key things that – so people have looked at these photographs and looked at little references here and there and sort of and squinted a little bit and seen – what are non-existent black confederates. And one of the key pieces of evidence that seems f very evident from the historical record is the Confederacy ultimately does pass a law that says we will, in fact, arm the enslaved and put them in, in the field. And this is at the in the 11th hour. This is March of 1865, just yeah. weeks before the Confederacy collapses. And they do pass the law, but it, it's too late for anything substantive to happen. Yeah. And as you point out, the debate about this law does not say anything about existing black Confederate right. soldiers, which you would have thought would have been either you know evidence for or against it. All the talk is about how radical yeah. and how novel and how incredibly risky this decision is because it's not been done before. So tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I find that to be just startling that in, in all of this discussion about, you know, sometimes we're talking about people who throw out numbers upwards of, you know, 50,000 soldiers. Yeah. But even if you throw out a smaller number, I mean, you know, quite often you'll see a number around 3,000, right? Mm -hmm. But even if we take that number, it is striking that no one during, at least what I found, you know, after roughly eight years of, of looking, of research, you know, no one, regardless of the position they take on the enlistment of slaves, no one sort of observes that there are already these men serving as soldiers in the Confederate Army. No one in the Army itself, and the soldiers themselves, you know, they took part in the debate. You know, regiments issued statements, individual soldiers wrote home, they wrote to newspapers, you know, sort of laying out their position. No one in the Confederate government, and no one on the home front at any point references that these men were already serving. And so it does raise, you know, a number of questions. And actually, I should add that during the war, I mean, there are a number of points in time where, earlier in the war, where it is suggested that Confederacy should consider recruiting slaves. And during the summer of 1862 on the Virginia Peninsula, as McClellan is pushing toward Richmond, there are a lot of observations, a lot of accounts that are published in northern news newspapers of people suggesting that black men are fighting as soldiers you know, in the Confederate Army. And whenever these reports get in the hands of Confederates, especially in Richmond, they deny it, mm -hmm. right? John Beecham Jones, who keeps a, a wonderful diary, he's working, I think, in the War Department in Richmond, and he gets word of these accounts in northern newspapers, and he is just beside himself. Why would we do mm -hmm. such a thing? It directly contradicts the very thing that we're fighting for. And, and this just continues, you know, right through November, November of 1864 and early 1865, when this is finally passed. No one is sort of you know, under the illusion that, that these men are already fighting in the ranks. And it's incredibly divisive for the obvious reasons. Yeah. And even people who, who support it understand the risk that they are taking mm -hmm. in moving forward. But as you mentioned, it's, yeah. it's a little too late. It doesn't make an impact. Maybe a very small number, upwards of about 40, are recruited in Richmond, but there's very little evidence that they see a battlefield. So the war ends. But I should also just point out really fast that you know, let's keep in mind that neither the United States or the Confederacy was excited about recruiting black men into their respective armies in 1861. Exactly. And there's something to learn from that, that for both sides, this was to be a white man's war. And, you know, as we all know, mm -hmm. the war ended in a Union victory before 1863, before January 1st, slavery likely would have still been intact. So I do think we need to keep that in mind. Yeah. In fact, the other piece of evidence is that is how Frederick Douglass and other people yeah. interpreted the war and the burning need to put black men in yeah. uniform for the Union, because he said, otherwise, it will be a white man's war and we will have no claim on any kind of rights. But if we put on the uniform, pin an eagle on our chest yeah. and put a rifle on our shoulders, we will have full claim to citizenship and full rights That's right. following the war. And speaking of following the war, another crucial piece of evidence that is misinterpreted are the fact that some African-Americans in five former Confederate states do receive pensions for service in the Confederate cause. Tell us if one really looks at the primary source evidence, what does it really tell us? Yeah, again, you'll find these references you know, all over the internet. The black men are receiving pensions for their service as soldiers. And again, what's, you know, what's striking is that all, all you have to do is look at the documents themselves, mm -hmm. and they pretty much lay out that these are you know, pensions for former slaves. Yeah, uh, five former Confederate states, most of them at the very beginning of the 20th century. And, you know, it's an attempt 
to give some aid to aging former slaves, specifically, and this is really important, specifically camp slaves. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a point in time where there's a great deal of racial unrest. In the post-war South, uh, white Southerners are, are cracking down rewriting their state constitutions to ban the largest number of African-Americans from voting. This is Jim Crow beginning to be embedded in the Southern states. And I interpret these pensions as a way to once again, reinforce the lost cause narrative. So at a time when there are younger African-Americans pushing for civil rights, African-Americans coming back, veterans from World War I wearing their uniforms, thinking that things are going to change on the racial front by focusing on these aged former slaves who served their masters in the Confederacy. It's a way of driving home the message of the kind of behavior that the white establishment expects from all African-Americans during the Jim Crow era. Right. And, you know, it is the, the pension documents are easily accessible. Uh, many of them are, are now online, so you can look at them. And the questions that they're asked are you know, there's a lot of overlap. They usually ask what regiment you were in, but they at the same time will ask, who did you serve? And they're not asking, of course, you know, what regiment they're asking for the master, your owner. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So again, you know, these states are, are singling out specific people, uh, African-Americans, because of the symbolism that they can latch on to at this point in time. Yeah. In fact, you point out that the application for these people to receive this pension in Mississippi is titled Application of Indigent Servants. Yeah. You know, it's explicitly calling them servants yeah. and not soldiers. That's right. And that's the application that Silas Chandler mm-hmm. would have filled out. Right. And so his is easily accessible as well. Well, let's jump ahead to where we began, which is sort of in the more recent times. And uh, the subtitle of your book is The Civil War's Most Persistent Myth. So, Tell us a little bit about how it manifests itself. We know that the internet is full of information, but it's actually crept into lots of other parts of the of the public sphere in recent times. Tell us about where it's appeared and what this amounts to. Yeah, so especially during the the Civil War sesquicentennial between 2011 and 2015, uh, there was an increase in sightings of Black Confederate soldiers, you know, not just on the internet but elsewhere. There was a Virginia textbook, a fourth grade history textbook that was released that included a reference to thousands of Black Confederate soldiers fighting with Stonewall Jackson in the Shenandoah Valley in 1862. There was a a National Park Service uh, exhibit in Mississippi that included a reference to Black Confederates and Silas Chandler. And there are a couple of monuments that have been dedicated in recent years. And I should point out that in regard to the National Park Service, they have corrected Mm -hmm. their exhibits over the last few years. And I think Beyond that, what I can say with some confidence is that although the the Black Confederate narrative has appeared in any number of places beyond the internet, it hasn't really made much of an impact. Mm -hmm. In other words, at least the mainstream narrative that was prevalent in any number of events during the sesquicentennial really focused on, you know, the latest scholarship in Civil War history. If anything, it was the narrative of emancipation and Black Union soldiers Mm -hmm. that was sort of front and center this time around. So it's still out there. And again, you can still find it on the internet, but it hasn't become mainstream. You know, it's still just off the beaten path, Mm -hmm. if you will. Yep. And hopefully your book will be part of this corrective that sort of will stand there to challenge some of the ways in which this evidence is misrepresented. And some of these claims are clearly based on on nothing but self-serving narratives. So by way of conclusion, how does this, obviously, you, you start to, started this book a long time ago, eight years ago, yeah. and before the big blow up about Confederate monuments and the Confederate battle flag and the kind of intense conversations and incidents that we see regarding race and white supremacy. So how do you see this work fitting into well, your, the Black Confederate narrative, but also your work to correct it? Yeah. You've obviously, I know from Twitter and from your your blog, you've been very busy <laughs> these past few years yeah. in commenting on this. Tell us a little bit about that in perhaps some of the impact it may have had on the final revisions to your book. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, certainly, you know, we are in the middle of a debate, very fierce, bitter debate about Civil War memory. And, and of course, it's manifesting itself in reference to monuments, Confederate monuments and memorials. And that's been the case since at least 2015. Mm -hmm. You know, at the center of that debate, it seems to me, is the question of how we remember the Civil War and Reconstruction. You know, we're 150 plus years later, 
and we still can't quite agree on the centrality of slavery, really coming to terms with emancipation, reconstruction, and just the broader history of race in America. And I'm convinced that it may sound cliche, but I am convinced that, you know, we're not going to be able to move forward until we come to terms with a lot of the myths that we have told ourselves, specifically as white Americans, Mm -hmm. about this period. And the Black Confederate myth, it reflects, you know, the difficulty of coming to terms with that past. And I'm hoping the book at least gives some people more of a footing on which to begin to think about the history and memory of the Civil War. Let's hope so. I think in some ways these trying times do often produce or compel historians and others, scholars, to weigh in on these matters. And so that's a hopeful way to frame it. And I share your guarded optimism. At least my my optimism is a little on the guarded side, but I, I, uh, I certainly hope so. Yeah. Well, Kevin Levin, this has been a great conversation. And your book, a lot of people have been waiting for it since you let it be known you were working on it. And so this is great that it's finally uh, seen the light of day. So thanks so much for taking the time to speak to us at In the Past Lane. It was great. Thanks a lot. Kevin Levin is the author of Searching for Black Confederates, The Civil War's Most Persistent Myth, published by the University of North Carolina Press and available wherever books are sold. And you can follow Kevin on Twitter at Kevin Levin. That's K-E-V-I-N-L-E-V-I-N. Okay, people, that's all for this episode of In the Past Lane. Thank you so much for tuning in. For more information about the many things we talked about today, head over to our show page for this episode at inthepastlane.com. I'm In the Past Lane's host, Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, reminding you that history explains our world. So let's pay attention to it. Thanks for listening. We hope you'll join us next time for another journey in the past lane. Hey, Lulu, if you could go back in time to witness any historic event, what would it be? The atomic bomb. SBI, Snoring Beagle International. Mm-hmm. <laughs>